Hello, welcome to our Reuters events newsmaker today. I'm Caroline Humer, the U.S. Editor for Health and Pharma. I'm joined today by Dr. Robert Califf, Commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Califf, a cardiologist, is in his second run as the head of the FDA, which regulates trillions of dollars worth of medical devices, pharmaceuticals, vaccines, food, cosmetics, dietary supplements, and tobacco products. He's been an academic, a researcher, a clinician, and previously ran the Duke Clinical Research Institute. Welcome. We're so glad you could be here with us today. Thanks, Caroline. Great to be with you. Uh, for our audience, please do remember that you can submit questions during this conversation, and um, we'll, we'll get started. Um, to, to start, Dr. Kellef, I think I'll, I'll give you a break from that very broad remit and just say that we'll be narrowing our conversation a bit to oversight of pharmaceuticals, a sector that um, uh, we spend a lot of time on here. Um, as you look out into 2024, what are the, rate, the agency's regulatory priorities for pharmaceutical oversight? Well, um, as, I, as I think you know, and just uh, for, for the audience, it's important to recognize that the FDA has a number of centers who um, are by law and um, by, by um, convention um, regulate a particular type of product. So we're limited to pharmaceuticals. You know, we'll be talking about the Center for Drugs and the Center for Biologics. And um, these are thousands of civil servants whose job it is uh, to regulate these products each with a each center with a leader who's a super leader. I'm a political appointee as a commissioner, and you know my job is to oversee it. But um, the work is really done by those centers, and each center has a whole set of priorities um, that are quite extensive. So I'll start maybe by just mentioning the overarching priorities that come to the level of the commissioner, and um, I'll name four that I think are really important. The first is um, misinformation. Um, we have to deal with a world in which um, we put out uh, what we think is the best answer to a question, and then immediately there's 24 by 7 discussion about it on the internet and everyone's opinion comes into play with someone who's only thought about a topic for a minute, able to reach perhaps a billion people um, in just a few minutes with their own opinion. And so um, understanding how to deal with that information environment, which is so radically different, is a big um, part of this because, after all, we spend years often um, evaluating a drug or a biologic as to whether the risks and benefits uh, weigh in on the side of benefit. And we make a statement um, about that in the form of approving for an indication and a label for that product. Um, but then a lot happens after that, and we want to make sure our messages do have a fair chance to get out there to the public. The second is an, another one that may not be intuitive to the average person, evidence generation. Um, we've done a pretty thorough, a very thorough assessment of the way we do our clinical trials and generate the information that informs our decisions. And I'd say the, um, with one exception that I'll go into uh, of great interest, I think the pre-market part of the FDA works really well. That is, people think of their best ideas. They try to develop a drug or a biologic. Um, after a lot of preclinical work, they have to attract investment, convince an IRB, uh, that is an ethics committee and an institution, that human studies can start. Um, the FDA has to say it's okay to go ahead. Still, 90% of uh, these products don't make it to market because they have an unexpected risk or toxicity or because they just don't work for the indication. And I think our system to weed out the things that don't work is really quite good. But then after the first FDA approval, there are a whole host of questions that affect society where we're working with other HHS agencies to try to develop a better post-market system, not just a survey for um, adverse events or toxicity, but also because there are many questions related to which product is better to use in a given situation, how do we combine them, those sorts of things. And those issues are not primarily in FDA's remit. We don't control that part the way we do the pre-market activity, but we have a role to play there. 
And in a society where, for example, every product that makes it on the market has this decision by the FDA, still about 90% of clinical practice guidelines, that is, the decisions that clinicians make in practice are not guided by high quality evidence because most of them have to do with what do you do with a product once it's out there in practice. Again, we don't control that, but it's a, it's a, a topic that we're all working in. The third area is generic drugs, and um, I think a lot of us took generic drugs for granted, including me and my career as a clinician for years. Um, it's been a wonderful thing that's been done to create the generic drug market. After a patent runs out, uh, the exclusivity runs out on an innovator drug or biologic, um, uh, then uh, the generic industry kicks in, essentially making a copy um, of where the formula is already known for how to make it. And the competition has been on price. And we're now up to almost 95% of prescriptions being generic, which is a great victory in terms of cost to the uh, um, American. These are low cost products, relatively speaking. But the price has gotten so low that um, we actually have a market failure going on where the inexpensive generics are frequently coming into shortage. So we've got to fix that um, problem, and we're doing a lot of work there. And then finally, this is Rare Disease Week, and everything I've said, um, I think, pertains to great progress in science and evidence generation and uh, related to rare disease. But because the science is moving so quickly and we have 10,000 or so rare diseases without an effective treatment, we are doing a lot of thinking within uh, drugs and biologics about how to best equip ourselves to be helpful um, as people develop amazing new therapies that will happen because of the fact that we can now do gene editing or just technologies that didn't even exist five years ago that hold promise for these um, patients. So I could go on and on, you can tell, but um, there are a lot of real specific um, issues uh, in each of those centers that um, we can talk about. But Again, my main point is these centers are full of professionals who um, are very focused on each aspect of this and uh, dedicated to the mission. Um, so one of, uh, you know, when it comes to this idea of, um, you know, the, the post, the sort of post-market work on drugs, I mean, one of the things that the agency has talked about um, in terms of addressing, uh, you know, so the proliferation of gene therapies, right, has been an increased use of accelerated uh, pathways towards approval, um, where, you know, the, the, the proof that the drug work comes a little bit later as it's sort of being used, right? Um, it, the evidence comes later. How, how does the agency see your regulation around this changing going forward? I mean, you're talking about working with other agencies on post-market. Are these two things in, how do they work together rather than be in, in conflict with each other, right? Well, I mean, I think it's fair to say that we have work to do in that regard because until recently, it literally was viewed for the most part that the FDA was like in a relay race where we ran the lap of, is a product safe and effective for a given indication? And then we handed off the baton with um, perhaps not even a smooth handoff to the payers who, and the clinicians who decide what to do with it and decide what's going to be paid for it. Now, I want to be clear that still within the law and within our remit, that first lap is ours to run and what happens after that is not in our control, but we uh, do have a role to play. That is the better job we do with the industries and the patient groups and the clinicians in putting together a portfolio of understanding of a drug or a biologic um, before it gets to market, the better the market forces are gonna be able to deal with it. And of course, now we have the IRA which has instructed CMS to begin to negotiate directly with the companies on a portfolio of drugs. And CMS has officially said that it will use real world evidence developed in post-market. So we now have a mutual interest in um, doing this as well as we possibly can. And I, I think I'm not being haughty here. I used to, I've worked on all sides of this, but 
I think it's fair to say if you go around the world, everybody turns to the FDA for the methodology part of this. How do you do it well? And we have a real uh, role there. NIH also has a very important uh, role. I'll just point to rare disease as a place, for example, because we're thinking so much about it right now. Um, if you think about serious rare diseases that um, lead to the deaths of children, for example, with no effective treatment, these problems can only be cared for in specialized centers of the types that tend to be academic medical centers funded by the NIH. And we need to um, work together very effectively with NIH to get the clinical studies done that are needed. But then for the reason that you gave, um, I think the public has spoken very loudly through our elected officials to create a set of laws that have instantiated accelerated approval and the deal basically is you get uh, the patient gets earlier access to a treatment and development um, where there's more uncertainty at the time that approval is given by the FDA. In return, um, the industry is expected to do the follow-up studies to clarify. Uh, in the case of gene editing, as an example, no one knows what the 15-year outcomes are after gene editing because the technology didn't exist until just the last couple of years. And so, um, you know, the, the, the term that's used in the law is reasonably likely uh, for the benefits to outweigh the risks. That's a judgment made by civil servants at the FDA who have no financial interest um, in the outcome, but are uh, looking out for the patients who are involved. But then we need a system of follow-up that inevitably will involve public-private partnerships through electronic health records because we'll need long-term follow-up of these people to make sure that everything's okay. Um, the gene editing, obviously very, um, you know, cutting edge. Um, in 2024, we also had our first, you know, implanted brain chips. Um, and there's a couple of different ones sort of in, in, in the, in the line there. So, you know, how, how does the agency um, approach oversight of, of this sector, which is which is so new and would seem to require so much, you know, care and 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 careful move, uh, careful approach? Well, I mean, first of all, I point out we've been um, dealing with devices used in surgery and implantation in the brain for a long time. This is not the fundamental concept is not new, and there's also a history now of experimentation done in academic medical centers um, in these areas with, you know, a real need to work on this interface between the brain and control of bodily functions, which can be interrupted by disease or um, tragic accidents that occur. So at its base, this is really no different than anything else that we do that involves risk. Um, and people, so um, I, I feel like we um, uh, have this under good control. And it's not that different than some other areas of brain surgery that, um, you know, are very important um, where advances are now being made. Um. Uh, so, so just turning a little bit, um, it seems uh, like we have been reporting that all of the world is interested in obesity drugs, um, and this is uh, an area where there have been supply issues, manufacturing issues, demand issues. I'm just wondering if there are sort of special regulatory or drug safety oversight um, for, you know, obesity drugs that um, you have in mind for 2024 as, as you look out um, towards the growth here. Sure. I, I mean, I should point out that I did research in this area before becoming commissioner the first time, um, was involved in one of the first long-term trials of a GLP-1 agonist drug, and so I followed it closely. Having said that, I should also point out, of course, the commissioner has absolutely no role in deciding which drugs make it to market. As I've pointed out, that's done by the centers. 
So I think as we look at this, first of all, um, it is amazing um, um, the impact of these drugs at this point, but also amazing the number of clinical trials. There are over 400 clinical trials now going on around the world, and there are multiple versions of drugs that are meant to affect this pathway. But like all drugs, you know, we have a saying at the FDA, and God we trust all others must bring data. So it's up to the um, companies and developers to do the clinical trials and get the answers. And I have nothing to say about any specific drug in my role until those studies are done and the relevant center has made its decision about what gets on the market. But what I can say um, is, you know, there are these broad areas that we have to pay attention to. I mean, who would have thought we would have a drug that's so profitable to the industry um, where uh, the industry can't make enough for the amount being sold? And so we do have shortages. And that leads to two problems that I'm very concerned about, just as a former practitioner, um, but also as FDA commissioner. Number one, people are attracted to... Um, um, compounded versions of this without um, the requisite um, controls to make sure that what you're buying is actually the active drug and not something that's contaminated or not even the active drug at all. So um, we have a whole set of issues related to the um, enforcement of people selling things to other people over the internet, for example, um, who are living difficult lives of working two jobs yeah. and having difficult, you know, can't get to Whole Foods to buy uh, the most nutritious, lowest calorie food are uh, the people least likely to get the treatment. So um, like, like all sort of amazing things in science, uh, tremendous uh, benefits demonstrated, a lot more to come that we just won't know until the data comes in and some real uh, problems that we need to, to deal with. Also, I know we're talking about drugs, but I'm uh, very focused on this right now. I don't, I think a hundred years now, people will look back of a, at us in sort of a strange way to say, you had a society where people were gaining weight as a population every single year for decades. And then you invented a drug that costs a fortune to try to reverse that later in life. And so we do regulate um, food at the FDA, the safety and also the labeling. And we got to pay a lot of attention to the nutrition of our society and not let people get down the road so far and then try to reverse it at tremendous expense. And, and, um, just to, to step back to the, the shortages a bit, um, it's not, you know, there is obesity drugs in shortage. There are other drugs in, in shortage as well um, that have, um, you know, from the sort of mainstay cancer treatments, um, we've seen the FDA be able to work there uh, in 2023 in terms of um, sort of getting more supply going. Um, do you need more regulatory um, powers as we look into 2024 to, to know more about the supply and the demand um, and, and where you can possibly work to, to um, mitigate the, the drug shortages and in, improve um, access? One, one could argue that you know, a drug in shortage is a drug that costs a lot and, and also lends itself to counterfeiting, as you mentioned. Well... I'll try to do this quickly. Um, okay. I'm spending a lot. I didn't expect to become an expert in supply chain when I became <laughs> FDA commissioner the first time, but I feel like I am now. So we've got to talk about three kinds of shortages that I think are inter probably interesting to your audience. We've talked about the um, weight loss drugs. That's a very specific kind of shortage where there's everything in it for the manufacturers to make enough because they're making money on every dose they sell. So the shortage we have there is time limited. I know that doesn't help people who can't get access now, but there's one thing you can depend on in American industry. If there's money to be made, and it's a good thing especially, 
they're, they're going to fix it, and that's in the works. We don't need more authority there. Um, we could use more authority and, and, and better understanding in the area of compounding and control of illicit markets that happen on the Internet. That's a very difficult area. Second kind of shortage, which I know a lot of people are concerned about, is stimulants, um, the ADHD drugs. That's different than all the others because it's a controlled substance. The DEA sets the limits on how much of that can be made. And we have a trade-off between the needs that people have for a legitimate, effective treatment for ADHD and several other conditions, and the fact that we're seeing this um, skyrocketing, um, historically overdose death rate in the U.S., of which the stimulants are a part, and stimulants are addictive. Uh, we, I won't talk about that unless people have more questions, but I just want to point out that's one people may wonder. The, the majority of shortages are actually not because of high price drugs. They're actually the opposite. The lower the price of the generic drug, the greater the likelihood of shortage for the reason that I gave. The industry is highly incentivized to make drugs on which there's a significant profit. Um, and if there's a drug where the price falls below the cost of making the drug, um, those that are manufacturing, I don't know about you, but I doubt if you're a news service would be in business if it wasn't making a profit. In fact, that's a problem in the news industry yeah. in general, I know. Yeah. And so um, the things that we can do at FDA, though, is more like um, patching the tire than it's like putting on a new tire. If we have the right information, we can. We spend a lot of time when there's an impending shortage working with the companies um, all around the world to make up for the impending shortage and to um, get enough of the product available. And um, I'd say by and large, there's been a lot of resistance on the industry side to giving us the information we need because it's often used in competitive yeah. business. But essentially, we filled in a lot of the holes already through on these things. You know, most recently, oncology, cancer drugs. Yeah. But not the expensive cancer drugs that are innovator. It's a generic, very old cancer drugs that don't make a profit. So we're working with the, with the U.S. government in general to try to deal with the market, essentially what I would regard as a market failure. And um, in, in, in terms, just to, to round out that last, um, this topic around uh, the, the counterfeit, um, how, how big do you think the scope of, of that is? I mean, looking at the, you know, sort of tracking what the FDA is tracking and the complaints in the adverse events database, we're wondering, um, you know, if, if there is a large, if you think the scope is much larger than, you know, the, the, maybe dozens of reports of hypoglycemia and hospitalizations that we're aware of that have been documented in the U.S. Um, you know, do you have a sense in, from an FDA investigation point of view that, that this is a, a broad problem here and overseas that you're involved in working with other outside agencies in other countries, um, that type of thing? Sure, you know, I just made a trip last week, actually, to the U.K. and uh, Europe to visit with our regulatory colleagues on the other side of the pond. So one part of what you asked, yes, it's a problem everywhere right now. It's not just a U.S. problem. And and we don't really have a good handle on what the denominator in total would be because we're dependent on spontaneous adverse event reports when someone thinks of it um, to send it in. But I can say in the context of the total picture of illicit drugs, being sold on the internet, it's almost certainly bigger than, much bigger than what we see. And if you want an eye-opening experience, you should see the um, international mail coming into JFK airport. And, you know, I would just caution Americans, don't buy um, pharmaceuticals over the internet unless you have some specific um, understanding for a particular reason 
uh, to know exactly where it's coming from because uh, a very high proportion of it is um, illicit, uh, contaminated, or the wrong drug. And so this is a huge problem. It, it just leads me to also say, you know, the generic um, drugs are so important and we carefully um, control those that are given by prescription in the U.S. So it's a real drug. If you go to low-income countries right now, a very high proportion of drugs that you would buy in the pharmacy are actually counterfeit or um, not uh, up to standards of potency. So there's a protective mechanism in the U.S. if it goes through the supply chain of um, imported or made in the U.S., uh, through a distributor in the U.S. to a pharmacy, to a prescription from a certified prescriber. But if you go outside of that, um, it's buyer beware and um, very dangerous, I would say. And, and do you do you have a sense of, of how much of, of what's happening here is, is sort of uh, being uh, produced in the U.S. versus overseas and being imported? Which will bring me to my next question, probably. I mean, I, I just have to say we don't have numerical data on that because no one's – obviously, these people are not reporting it to us. And compounding in the U.S. is a very complicated – um, industry in which there's joint oversight by the FDA, but also by the states. Yeah. Um, I think actually I'll, I'll take a second and bring in an, an audience uh, question. I mean, we're talking, you mentioned earlier, 400 clinical trials around obesity. Um, you know, I think one of the, you know, is there a cost there? Are there areas of drug, drug research now that you feel are underinvested in um, when you see an industry sort of all moving in one direction? <laughs> Guilty is not the right word for me to use about myself here, but I used to rail about, um, you know, we went through a decade where almost nothing was developed for my specialty in cardiology. And now, you know, these drugs are developed for obesity, but, you know, um, uh, the, the trials are also evaluating cardiovascular outcomes, for example. And there have been other cardiovascular drugs the last couple of years. So um, I can't complain about my specialty anymore in this regard. But um, we definitely have some great needs. And I would point to mental health as the number one area. We're suffering as a country. Everyone knows that. We're not seeing the kind of productivity of R and D in mental health, and um, it's a it's a very significant problem. I'd also point to chronic lung disease. Um, you know, the biggest growth of disease and shortened life expectancy in the U.S. You know, we all know about um, overdoses and COVID and gunshot wounds, those things, but chronic disease is on the rampage in the U.S specifically in the U.S., we have a shorter life expectancy than almost any other high-income country now. I have to say, when I was in uh, Brussels, uh, they're very interested in the things we're doing in the U.S. And I said, we need, maybe we need to learn a bit from you because you're living more than five years longer on average than we are in the U.S. But chronic lung disease is an area that we tend to, for whatever reason, it's, it, it hasn't seen uh, the breakthrough therapies that we've seen in many other areas. So those are two I would um, I would pick on. There, there are others, but we need to figure out how to um, stimulate more R&D and better approaches to intervention in those diseases. Um, and, and I mean, you mentioned um, chronic lung disease. I, I might just throw in one more from the audience here. It's, it's a little off topic because um, it has to do with cigarettes, but you know, there, there's a lot of interest out there um, in around the menthol cigarette ban, and and our audience is just wondering if if when when that might be finalized, how we might see that move forward. Um, I mean, I, I think it's well, I don't think it's publicly known that we um, finished the rule and submitted it to Office of Management and Budget, where um, it has to go through a process there and. We don't control the timeline and don't uh, have a date, but I don't need to tell you it's very high priority at the FDA and we're anxious to get it done because there are a lot of lives 
at stake. I was, it really struck me a couple of weeks ago, I was with an FDA employee, um, who happens to be from my hometown. And, uh, you know, he, he mentioned that as, uh, this came up as a topic. He said, you know, my brother died at age 40, addicted to, of lung cancer, addicted to menthol tobacco. And, um, you know, so we're, we're hopeful that we'll make progress here. Um, so you, you brought up um, mental health before. I think maybe I'll, I'll ask now about, um, well, we, we've seen, you know, a proliferation of unapproved treatments um, for the tap into psychedelic drugs like ketamine. Um, and, and we're also talking about sort of the, the potential um, federal rescheduling of marijuana, um, which which the FDA supports. Um, I know these two things aren't directly related, but um, you know, just wondering how the FDA sort of looks at this area, and you know, when you do you have a plan around mar marijuana based treatments and pathways? Should should the drug be rescheduled to something to something lower? Do you see potential? there for um, for more treatments. There's just a handful now that, that sort of incorporate different elements of marijuana, obviously. Well, let me bring up two concepts here. Um, the first is that um, no matter what our plans are, um, it's important to think about the FDA more like a referee in sports and like the owner of the sports team. That is, we have authorities that are given to us by laws that are written by our elected officials in Congress. And we can't extend beyond those laws because the minute we do, we're taken to court. And um, so, you know, you can take it for granted, FDA is full of employees who abide by the laws. And so um, we have this, so the second concept is we have this category of things in our society. And it's a spectrum, like you talked, you mentioned, um, Ketamine. There's a version of um, S-ketamine, which is um, uh, a, a legal drug that can be prescribed under carefully guarded conditions. And you have things like psychedelic drugs, which, um, you know, I was a child of the 60s. Um, I'm getting on up there in age, and so I feel like I'm reliving um, parts <laughs> of history. But there probably are, are therapeutic uses of psychedelic drugs, and we have pathways for therapeutic development. And then you have things like um, cannabis, and there are, there are up to 30 different versions of cannabis now in various forms. CBD, for example, which has been separated out in law, is not having the, um, the, the, the same properties on the brain at the levels uh, of CBD. Um, but kratom, and I would just put in tobacco in this category too. These are things where there's not a medical benefit Society has decided not to outlaw them. Prohibition that was not highly affected with alcohol. It's not our decision as to whether to prohibit them. It's a matter of whether Congress Congress has to make that decision and pass a law. And so I do think that we've learned a lot with tobacco about harm reduction as, in other words, in the pharmaceuticals that you're talking about, Presumably, the goal of every product is to extend life or improve the quality of life. And our regulations are meant to optimize that. In the case of tobacco, the mission written in the law is to reduce the harm from tobacco. And so with these other products, um, you know, we have views uh, and we've learned a lot. But it's going to be up to our, uh, you know, uh, as we like to say, we look forward to working with Congress to come up with a legal structure that um, allows the best regulation. I hope that makes sense. It does. And and I'm I'm curious now when when it comes to to food products then where where does that put you with food, you know, with gummies and lollipops and where is that all does the FDA have any does that cross over into food for you with your oversight there? Well, um I think one of the most interesting parts of my job is that since, as I've already said, I don't delve into individual product decisions, for example, by the centers, it's important that political appointees not tip the scale on that, that it's done by civil servants who have no conflicts and have the interest of public health as their primary 
goal. But there are so many areas of FDA where there are overlaps across centers. You know, the age-old question, is cannabis um, a drug? Is it a dietary supplement? Is it a food? I mean, you can eat it. You can smoke it. Um, uh, these are these are hard questions. One place where the authority becomes similar is when there's a harmful product being sold and there's proof that it causes harm, then we have a duty to enforce. Um, and we take that very seriously. Um, but, you know, we have to have hardcore evidence in order to enforce because every uh, we live in a country where people have a right to um, defend themselves if they're accused of something. And so, you know, we, we have a whole part of FDA that does nothing but investigate these cases. I will say that, um, for example, selling CBD in the form of gummy bears that are attractive to children um, on, an, on an open market, um, I, just as a person and as a doctor, um, it's just that's bad. And, you know, I hope we can continue to deal with it. Yeah. Um, one of the, uh, you know, areas that, that um, has had a, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, attention the last few years is, is whether or not the U.S. would allow drug imports to, to try to, as, as a potential lever to address some of the, the drug pricing issues here. And so, so far the FDA has approved Florida's request and is working on that, but there are, there are several out there that are still, that are still pending. And, um, you know, I wanted to check and see, you know, do we expect that idea to gain traction? We've just spent a lot of time talking about, you know, the, the, the drug supply and counterfeiting. And, and I know those have been some of the concerns of the FDA in the past. Well, um, what I'd say is Congress wrote a law that makes it possible for states to import drugs specifically from Canada in bulk. And the criteria for um, getting approval to do that from the FDA are very clear in the law. And I would stress that it's not easy because remember what I said about the supply chain of prescription drugs. It's very tight because you can really hurt people if you counterfeit a drug or put something in it that's shouldn't be there, can be extremely harmful. Or you hurt people, you know, I'm taking four generic drugs for my hypertension and elevated cholesterol that most 72 year old people have along the way. And if I got a drug that was half as potent as I thought it was, I could have a heart attack, never knowing that I didn't yeah. get the treatment I thought I was getting. And so uh, this supply chain issue is it's a bulk of what states have to assure and it's hard work, and, but if if a state meets the criteria that are in the law, we have a phenomenal team of people who are um, there to help. And um, you know, as I, like I said about product approvals, this decision is made in uh, Cedar. You know, in the um, in 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 the part of FDA that makes those decisions, not by me, but they have criteria and they go by the criteria and do it. Now, it's important to mention that just getting approval from FDA is only the end of the beginning because Canada would have to make it possible yeah. for this to happen. And that's outside of our control at FDA. Um, there's a written record um, of Canada's views on this, and that still has to be negotiated after we say it's okay to do it. Okay. Another part, just to mention, the state would have to have an adverse event reporting system. That's also a lot of work that has to meet the standard that we have. Right. Um, and, and just looking at the, you mentioned you're, you're taking four generic drugs. So a lot of Americans are. Um, and so, you know, what, and a lot of that is, is made overseas. Um, so how is the FDA, you know, positioned at all to, to increase oversight of manufacturing facilities outside of the U.S., given, um, you know, the, the great need, the, the struggle with shortages, 
And, you know, some instances we've seen where, where you know, a lack of oversight by the, by the countries of, of their production has led to issues. Well, I think it may be useful to think of this in three tranches. First of all is, is um, how are these generic drugs made? And, you know, right now, a very high proportion of the key starting material, the chemicals from which drugs are made, actually comes from China. And then if you look at, okay, you got the chemical, how do you make it into a drug? Um, the active pharmaceutical ingredient and finished product. There is a global distribution of manufacturing of that, but a very high proportion of it is in India. Less of it is in the U.S. for the reason that I gave. It's not that the U.S. doesn't have the capacity to do it. It's not at the cost of U.S. labor. It's not profitable. And so the U.S. manufacturers have focused on other um, areas. And so there's an industrial policy and a national security question. Um, do we want to bring more of this into a secure supply chain, either onshore or nearshore? And that's one part of it. I think the answer to that is yes. The question is how much and how do you do it? Uh, the, the, the second part is how, what do we deal with the fact that uh, the prices have dropped below the cost of production. Because let's say even in India, you are running a manufacturing plant for a drug and the price drops to a level that's below what it costs to keep the equipment in shape, what are you going to do? And if you want to stay in business, you cut your costs and take risk. And um, there's a lot of discussion of what our industrial policy needs to be between the hospitals, the uh, group purchasing organizations, the distributors, all that supply chain. And if you draw a picture of it, well, and you've seen pictures of this with money going this way and that way in the form of rebates, et cetera, it looks like a Rube Goldberg contraption of some kind. Uh, we need to clarify that and fix it. But there's a big part for FDA. And we have been very focused on, as we already discussed, getting data like how much of each of the different kinds of supplies is in which facility so that when there is a threat and shortage, we can, instead of having to make phone calls to collect the information, you know, in a, in a crisis, we're actually able to use data to um, essentially perform uh, quick um, dates for different companies that didn't use to work together to make the product. But we've also really upped our game in terms of inspections. But you mentioned a problem as we're um, doing inspections more frequently, um, we're going to find more problems. And then a supply chain that's not resilient, it actually increases the risk of short-term shortages because if a manufacturing line goes down to fix a quality problem, there's no reserve in the system right now. So all these things are factors. I hope, um, I hope uh, th this is helpful in understanding it. I, I think, you know, the discussions now are really taking all these things into account. So it's another area where um, we look forward to working with Congress and others on a, fixing this in the long term. I, I feel um, also obligated to point out this has been going on for 20 years. It's not a new problem. It's just gotten more, COVID highlighted it and made it more severe. And we still got, um, you know, more visible problems in the uh, immediate post-pandemic era. But if you went back 10 years ago, every hospital in the U.S. had a group of people who did nothing but deal with shortages in the generic supply. Right. And 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 I'm and how 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 much has the Indian cough syrup situation sort of galvanized at all people? I mean, if if it's been uh, in terms of contamination and oversight, do you feel that that has, that has helped at all with trying to get the world to understand how much is at stake? Well, there's, there's a thing in uh, regulation, which, you know, I'm a latecomer to regulation. I was, you know, in my mid sixties by the time I went from being a clinician and academic to a regulator. There's a thing in regulation where bad things that happen cause people to see the need for the regulation. When things are going well, it seems like no one wants to be regulated. That's sort of understandable. So the cough syrup um, catastrophe, which didn't affect the US, um, but 
um, killed a number of children in Asia, um, really called attention to the problem. And I got to say, you know, um, in my uh, academic history, I spent a lot of time in India, and I love uh, India as a country. It's fascinating. Uh, but I've had the chance to make a number of connections with the Indian government, um, for example. Um, and, you know, they're big players in this industry, and this is key to their economy. There's a lot of goodwill right now in terms of fixing the problems that we've seen. And of course, these problems are not just in India. We have had a number of problems in U.S. facilities, too. Mostly, I think, of the kind we don't see, as I say, with innovator drugs, because the margins are high enough that companies invest in quality. And we've got to get this industry. I mean, it's so vital. If you think about public health, it's important that 340 million Americans, but there's 7.6 billion people in the world with rising rates of chronic disease. And they need a secure, low-cost supply of generic drugs also. Thanks, Dr. Califf. Thanks so much for, for joining us today and, and being part of this Newsmaker. It was great to, to talk with you and have you here. Great to talk with you. Take care. Okay, thank you.